Welcome to Face to Facts. It's good to see everybody here once again. We have a lot to talk about today in a in as much time as we can covering all four of our sports teams right now. Uh, obviously, we know the Celtics just took on the Brooklyn Nets and a nice sweepage. Kyrie was blasted to the moon. We absolutely love that around here. Brings nothing but joy and a huge smile to my face to see that pill out of the playoff picture. So congratulations to the Celtics on round one. Check. We have the Bruins who are just about ready to start their playoffs about six days away. We'll talk about who we're expecting uh, for their first round. We'll talk about our thoughts and, and our feelings towards what they're going to do for this upcoming playoff. We got to talk about the Suck Sox, and then we got to talk about the uh, Patriots who have a draft upcoming. Yes, you heard me right, the Suck Sox. We all knew it was coming. We all knew. We all knew, and this is the team they put together, and I, I have a lot of gripes to talk about with this team. I am actually rooting against them currently. I think, Phil, you know from my little thing that we on, on my post that happened about a week ago, I share my rant. We'll share our thoughts on that whole thing, but absolutely have to start with those green teaming surging. How much more can I emphasize them? The Boston Celtics, the talk of the town right now. It's stunning. I, again, the turnaround that they've had. If I told you come January 1st, that this team would be the best team in the NBA. I think many people would laugh at me, would probably say that you're the most moronic person on the face of the earth, that there is no chance in hell that that's going to happen. Well, <laughs> here we are today. Here we are today. And I, I guess I got to say, I'm sorry, Phil. I'm sorry. You believed. You believed all along. Well, this. Believed. No, hey, listen. I wanted Tatum out of here. I wanted Brown out of here. I wanted uh Adoka. i thought i sh we should yeah. fire him i think i should be fired right now no you weren't wrong and a lot of people weren't wrong because like they weren't up to their potential i think we and i when i was on this when i was on this program talking to you guys about it and i'm a, i'm a fan if you want to call me a green teamer that's fine but i also think i'm realistic i think i i always contested the listen if they play the way they're supposed to play if they play together they play defense, and they had a, a field general on the court, which Marcus Smart has turned into. And I suggested just trying to get someone else to be it or bring someone else in, like a Rondo or someone like that. But they realized, like, oh, Marcus Smart, yeah, get in that, uh, accept this role, do this thing. And I'll, I'll raise you one other thing uh, regarding, like, I'll raise your uh, people who thought you were an idiot if you were to say in January, this team would be the best in the NBA. Well. I'll and raise, right I'll raise now, that point. I'm an absolute no. idiot when it comes to the Celtics, you heard it here. <laughs> if he wants to yell at me on the streets, go right ahead. Go but right that ahead. Isn't your, that isn't right. your bag though. Basketball isn't your bag overall. It is not. Uh, but you weren't wrong in being like, these guys aren't performing and they don't look like the team they should be. But also I'll raise you that point you made earlier. Like you would be called an idiot. How about this? What if you said in January, Hey guys, uh, not only will they seem like the best team in the NBA, but they're going to sweep the Brooklyn Nets in the opening round. No way. No, you would. I mean, even even before this series, no I was like, oh, it's going to be a tough series, but I think they're going to win it because uh, you know who do you, it's Kevin Durant, Kevin Durant, and it's Kyrie, uh, arguably two of the best in the also NBA. Also, thought that Crybaby Simmons wouldn't even show his face in this series. Well, All right. <laughs> Well, I had an inkling that he came he, I mean, out yesterday. He said he's not mentally ready. He can't do this. He needs his blanket and bottle. The poor thing. <laughs> yeah, I I'm mean, a Brooklyn Nets fan. I go hunt him down right now, pack his bags, and get him out of here. What an absolute sin bag he is. A what? A sin bag. A sin bag. Oh, yeah, oh, a bag full of sin. Bag. I'm sorry. I thought you were saying he's sin bad. Like he's a like sin bin in hockey. I'm gonna call him a sin bag. Not Sinbad, Sinbad. Get him out of here. Because there's a great, great Stop. joke about. Stop it. Yeah. Well, listen. And uh, you got yeah. the James Harden. What is well, wrong with this team? Well, well I mean, again, this is the same team that gave you Jason Tatum. Mm -hmm. Let's not forget this. No, oh, actually, no, that was Philly. Sorry. That was that Philly. Was, no, but then the same. I know what you're. Yeah. 
but all those different picks and everything that they're, they're awful management team. I think the biggest, the biggest enjoyment for me though, from this series, as much as it was, you know, frigging awesome to see Kyrie cry and, you know, flip fans off at the garden and have a hissy fit on the court, get fined 50 grand. You know, that was awesome. It was sweeping them number one, but it was also seeing how much chemistry this team has with with gelling with one another. I mean, Tatum was an absolute superstar that series. Superstar. Tatum, Brown was amazing in that fourth quarter, and Al Horford, Marcus Smart, like, go down the list. Even if they didn't have... Yeah. Everybody contributed for the most part. I still don't particularly love the Derek, uh, the Derek White. That's he a popular, yeah. Going, popular you know, opinion. That's going to be an issue, especially if we got the Bucks this upcoming series. Yeah. But on a positive note, if you're a Celtics fan, if the Bucks are who we're most likely going to face next round, okay, yeah, you have Giannis. We all understand that. But Chris Middleton is out. He's out. So yeah, that's who knows huge. for how long? Yeah. It's a huge advantage for the Celtics right there. And quite frankly, if the Celtics can get through the box in this series, you know, here and here first, the Celtics will be going to the finals. That's just my take. That's my feelings and beliefs on that. If you look me in the eyes right now, I have a gun to my head. Who's going to win the NBA finals this year? I'm going Boston Celtics right now. Yeah, I, I, from the East. From the East, I, I think they have a really good shot. And I think they should be – I mean, Miami is pretty great. Uh, Miami is not a bad – they're no slouch. The Bucks aren't a slouch. If you've been watching any of the – I know this is Tom's first <laughs> full watch of the Celtics uh, well, in almost uh, 14 years. Well, I – you know, I've been – I actually couldn't watch to the last one. A little bit more as, as things started to click. Yeah. I will tell you that, you know. If, if something's happening and somebody gets hot, again, fair weather fan, you can say I'm, I'm like that with the Celtics. But, but that's what fandom is. I'll, I'll be the first one to tell you, though, that if I see something that's positive or something that's good on the court and it's worth, you know, watching and enjoying and everything, fully, fully admit, I, I'm enjoying the Celtics right now. Never thought I'd say that this year. Never They're thought great, I'd say it. Great so and I watch. never thought you would yeah. be saying that either. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> no way. The uh, the Vegas Sharks are kind of they're pissed because they're losing money on this Nick Face bet. What did you like um, the most from the series yourself? I told you about my you know thing. With um, but what did, what did you what was your biggest takeaway from the series, Phil? Well, let's let's get to and I, I kind of mentioned I couldn't I couldn't watch Game Four on Monday, but I was covering a select board meeting for North Reading. But I did have my phone on GameCast, which is a game saver. But I also had the NBC Sports app which is great, but I, I chose not to do that because I'm like, I don't want, like, I actually have to pay attention. Just but, uh, yeah, well, and it went on, oh, it didn't go on, and, yeah, sorry. No, it actually, that was, it was, a, it was shorter than, it uh, It was shorter than usual. It was nice, whatever. Saving grace. I was watching GameCast, and the thing that got me was despite this, just how they were able to close out, close it out in, yep. in, in these games. And the fourth, game four, like, and you can say the Nets quit, on a lot of levels and maybe game three was the biggest example of that but they played they played you like they whether or not they had the talent to really like play defense again to uh uh well enough or not they played you they gave you listen you took hits you took runs from a kevin durant led team whether he was at his best or not eh, i'd still take a depleted kevin durant over a, you know 90 percent or 95 percent of the players in the nba I'd rather have him on the floor, especially late games, if I had to take one shot. But they, I will they, say with the, whole, with the whole Kevin Durant thing, the one thing that the Celtics did tremendously with it is they took the fouls when necessary and put you put Kevin Durant at the line because yeah. he's not going to beat you from the line. He's not. He's not going to do that. He'll make those shots. He'll make them. He'll but, make yeah, you're them. right. He yes. won't. But him in the field during this series wasn't, wasn't, wasn't superb. Because the Celtics pretty much eliminated that. You know, outside of Kyrie having his yeah. great game one and everything like that, you know, um, nobody really else from Brooklyn, I want to say, really, really rose to the occasion. No, he didn't. Kevin Durant didn't control games. And even when Kyrie had a fit, he had a great game one. Oh, absolutely. And he was, he was hitting everything. 42 points or whatever it was. Oh, it's nuts. Oh. Uh, and he was hitting from everywhere. But he wasn't. 
he totally whiffed on that last play low of the game, yeah. which I mean, but also like, you know, what do you expect him to play against? That's, that's a disadvantage that Brooklyn had. They were very small and not long and not as athletic as the seeds. And the seeds are a mismatch for a lot of teams, but they can't going back to that game four. They close that game out with like almost three minutes ago, like 248. You have Jason Tatum, whatever you think of the uh, six foul call on him, whatever you think about it, regardless of it. Yeah, it's all. Yeah, it is the, the, the NBA. Is in the NBA. Yep. They're all protected by their union so they can do whatever they want. Which I would imagine like you could always fire or do whatever, but you just need to take that hit. And if you want to take the hit, you take the hit. But the NBA doesn't, and I'm sure, you know, the cost analysis-wise. To, 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 to suckage, basically. <laughs> well, I mean, it all depends what you want to do. But uh, regardless of all of that, the C's run, and they're up by six, which, you know, you could argue isn't that much of a padding, especially when you have Kevin Durant and Kyrie Irving uh, on the other end of that court. But you know what? They, they held up, and they made some great plays at the end. And I – he could have say that last pass by Jalen Brown to Marcus Smart that outlet after that uh, Durant miss, that uh, and also Nick Class uh, that Durant uh, uh, free throw miss, which is crazy. It was huge. It would have put him, I think, down by um, two. Uh, it wouldn't down down by one. Yeah. And uh, it, you know Jalen Brown kind of whips it across the court, lot you know just throws that outlet. And well, some people, well executed play yeah. in the right place at the right time, I will say. Yeah, I, I think wasn't executed, uh, wasn't finalized by Smart, but Al Horford was there, who was another guy. I say is the reason, part of the reason for your turnaround. Ume Udoka. Yeah, he's been and the Al Horford. He's been the member. Yep. Yeah. Yep. The last thing I do yep. want to yeah. say on, um, on this series from everything is, you know, we saw Kyrie have that big game one, but we all heard – and saw exactly what happened with uh, Kyrie getting upset and flipping off fans and getting his uh, big fine and everything from the NBA. This is, this is why I think Kyrie disappeared the rest of the series is because Kyrie doesn't know how to not compete by being an ass, basically. Kyrie had to take a back seat because he knew he was going to get fined and the NBA was going to suspend him or something like that. So much to the point, like, in a way, it's like Brad Marchand in a way with the Bruins. Like if you if he gets a suspension or something happens, they have to change their games and their mentalities of being, you know, the quote unquote holes out in the court, you know, the dirty, dirty kind of guy. Like he has to have some sort of a competitive edge to him. You eliminated that from Kyrie. And I think that took away from Brooklyn being any sort of competition with the Celtics with getting any kind of victories. Um, so I think that ego trip that he had for that game one, the Celtics fans, congratulations. I mean, you got right to that guy's head. You took that away from him for the last three games. It's a big reason why Brooklyn's not, not, not your winner in this series, in my opinion. Yeah. I mean, I don't think the, the Celtics crowd, actually the Celtics crowd, you argue fueled him. Oh, uh, but the fueling is I think what eliminated well, that's, you know, that's, two, a, that's a fair, I mean, I don't think, was, I don't think that was the fans. I don't think, yeah. I, I think, I think that's emotions anymore. I think he was in control. He was, he was using, he was channeling his emotions. He was using them to realistically put points on the board, but I, I, I will, I will agree with you. I don't agree that the fans knew that that would happen. That course of events would happen to lead to him being um, uh, kind of uh, suppressed a bit. Cause I think you're right. I think there was a fire in his belly that had to be subdued a bit. Uh, by the league and by possibly his team and his teammates. Because I, I think, think like team, right, Phil. I think the team possibly to cut it out. You can't be doing this with everything because we're going to well, get in trouble. And, yeah, and you know what? If he can't, he doesn't have that. If he, if he can't have like you say, like that fire in his belly to go out and compete like that, like a Martian. Uh, or right. he, that passion and and yeah. fire and and any any sort of like will to win was yeah. was stripped from him. And to your point, I don't agree. think the fans were trying intentionally to do that. Mm. It was more so, I think, Brooklyn and the NBA that took it away. And that that pretty much made Kyrie go back into his little bunny hole and hibernate for the rest of the for the rest of the play. Yeah, I mean, and he still had some key buckets. Like this game four, he had some key, he had a key three-pointer that cut, it, I think, down to like three or two. Yeah. Uh no, I think three at the end of the fourth. And you know what? He I mean, we always hate to hear this, but yeah, Kyrie is one of the best uh, yeah. players out there. And if we had him on our team, 
if, if Kyrie got his his collective, uh, you know, poof together and just like, I don't know what he needs. I don't know what he needs. You know what I mean? And that's the thing. What does yep. he need to, to get to a place where he can just be him and do it and like incorporate his teammates? And well, I know what he needed. He needed, he needed a goddamn vaccination. That's what he needed to be on the floor uh, for most of the time with his teammates. And that one of the things that kind of dri- will drive you mad which, you know, maybe there's no self-awareness. Maybe it just kind of like doesn't care. I would appreciate it more if you said, you know, I don't, I did what I had to do. That was my thing. And th- yeah. this was the byproduct of it. Byproduct of uh, me not getting my vaccination, me meaning Kyrie, uh, is that I couldn't play over half, if not half of the NBA season. Right. And that's, who knows what happens next year. I actually hope the Celtics get Bradley Beal. They add him to the team and we don't have to take away much. Adam wants him. Yeah, Tatum wants he does. him. And he's going to be a free agent, I believe. So wouldn't be surprised if they pull some strings to do some some something to make that happen. And I but, think you need to, because I think I think the Nets will be desperate to do some things this offseason. Maybe they they armor up. And regardless, I think th- those two will be together for the whole season. They'll find a way to jail with Joe Harris and them. And they'll they'll find a way to put it something together. They'll be dangerous. The East is going to be crazy. And this is the window for the Seas to win one. It really no, is. No, I agree. Real this window. Is their opportunity to do it. All right. I want to transition over to the Bruins because we have another team that's uh, doing actually fairly well in their last week of uh, their regular season. Good night, Phil. Um, <laughs> uh, um, uh, well, they're getting ready for their, their playoffs, which will be starting in about a week and everything. They have the return now, finally, of Posternick, Lindholm. They got Allmark back between the pipes and everything. So the health and everything is looking positive here for the Bruins. Without Pasta and, you know, Lindholm and some of those other players, it, it wasn't going so hot. And I think Tom would probably say the same thing on that. But here's the thing here. You know, they got a big win last night against the Panthers. Panthers are most likely going to be your President's Cup uh, winners uh, for the regular season. Best team in hockey with the most wins. They beat a pretty damn good team last night, Tom. They did. They did a fairly good job with everything with a nice, uh, a nice solidified win. The question here, though, for me is you have what two two games to go. You have Buffalo and you have Toronto. Yep. I don't think there's any chance of the Bruins jumping up any more slots um, to change the playoff picture on how things go. So I think the Bruins will. I'm 99.9% sure they'll finish as the one, uh, the, not the wild card one spot. And it's <laughs> like they'll be facing the Carolina Hurricanes. And that, yeah. that comes with a mixed bag of feelings with myself on it. I don't want to be a pessimist on this, but Carolina absolutely destroyed the crap out of the Bruins the regular season. And I know it's the regular season, but. I don't know what to feel on this right now. Yeah, I don't, well, so, I mean, there is the likelihood of them jumping up a spot uh, in the standings are very slim, but there is still a chance. Um, it just catch depends Tampa. on. It would be to catch Tampa. Would that be yeah, correct? They're, they're three points behind Tampa. They have both teams have two games left. Um it really just depends on if teams rest their players or for the playoffs or not. Um, Cause I mean, Sabres, the Bruins should win. They should win that game. Um, and I mean, who knows what Toronto will do. I mean, in the past they've rested all their top guys like Matthews and Tavares and, but it also hasn't really paid off for them either because they don't do anything in the playoffs. Um, so we'll see what they do. I mean, I mean, Tampa, Tampa isn't a young team either. All their, all their big guys, all their stars, they aren't, they aren't young anymore. So who knows what they're going to do? So I mean, it, it's slim, but yeah, I don't really like chances against Carolina in the first round. No, I don't. I think that if they do get them, I don't want to say they want to, they're going to lose because that doesn't. I want to be optimistic on this. And maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong on this. Maybe the health of pasta is going to be great after this two weeks of two weeks of downtime. And 
maybe Almark is going to be your your stud here in the playoffs because in my eyes, I see him as your game one starter, being the hottest goaltender right now. Uh, you got to go with the hot hand, in my opinion. Yeah, um, I mean that their that first game back for all three of them was huge. Like they yeah. all did incredible. It was a boost, big time boost that was it, it was extremely needed. I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe they'll have the push now to make it through the playoffs now that everybody's back to full health and we're you know they're on a win, nice little win streak right now, um, and everybody is producing for the most part. Um, so, I mean, it is the playoffs. It's a completely different season. Uh, so, I mean, who knows what's going to happen. I do want to do a shout-out to Eric Holla. I mean, holy God, has he been incredible this the, ever since the trade deadline. The amount, of, the amount of clutch goals and points, and this is what the Bruins were expecting him to. You know, I don't know if they were expecting this kind of production when they got him in the offseason. But I, he's my he's my sixth player award winner of the season, no question in my eyes. Yeah, he's um he's a big he's a big player when it comes down to the last stretch. Yeah, and uh, he will he's going to be a big boost in the playoffs. He he's always done well, performed well in the playoffs, and I mean that the first two lines are going to be ridiculous if they can produce the way that they're expected yeah, to produce. It's going to be insane to see what they can do. And we finally got the monkey off Brad Barshan's uh, shoulders. An 11-game drought of no goals. Finally put in an empty netter last night, and I'm hoping that's going to click start him. That's, that's going to be huge, too. I, I'm hoping that's a boost for him because now he's got the confidence back a little bit and the swagger, and now now hopefully that's going to help line one. Because I, I have been concerned with line one. Uh, for, for a bit now definitely Bergeron is showing showing big signs that this th this could be it this could be it um, they got a goal from DeBrusque last night I think DeBrusque has settled in on on the first line fairly well um, who would have thought that he would have been your first line you know first line for a player out there no way but that first line they they gotta they gotta be the the the, the catalyst here to yeah. get a good start off in this first round if this is going to be Carolina. I mean, who knows? Maybe maybe the way that the second line is performing right now, maybe the second line will be the line first out in the first game. Could be. My other big concern here. I have two. The power play is now 0438, I believe, right now. Again, why I'm concerned with Marshan and Bergeron and all that right there. I think it's time to sit those guys down on your power play for right now. And I think you got to go with a holla. I think you got to go with Coyle and maybe Taylor Hall of some sorts right there. Because right now, you aren't getting anything from it. And I don't want to go backwards and think about the Tory Krug days with the energized power play and everything like that. But it's missed. Tory Krug is missed on this team because he's a puck moving defenseman. You're not getting that from Carlo. You're really not getting that from McAvoy. You're not. It's picking up a little bit more. I'm sorry, but you decided to choose, and I know it's money and everything like that and all that, but Grizzlick is just not good. He's not. And they think he's better than he's supposed to be. And he's not. So that's my great player right now. He's a third line defenseman. That's it. That's it. So maybe they, maybe they got to make some kind of move and they got to put Lindholm on it because I haven't seen Lindholm on a power play. I haven't. Put him out there. Make a change. I'm hoping that at practice right now, Cassidy is put his – put his stick down on the ice and said, this is what we're going with. If we're not going to get those production points right there for everything, sit your ass down. They need me to get the kick in their ass is what they need. They need me. There's too much softy, softy bull crap that goes on with some of these sports stars. It's ridiculous. You can't produce, sit down. Next person up. The other thing that I am concerned with, with the Bruins too, 
What is going on with two minutes or less in a period with this freaking defense? Did you see what happened last night? I almost yeah. had a brain aneurysm. Five freaking seconds left in the freaking period, and the goal and puck goes in the net. This has been like the sixth time in friggin' two weeks. What the hell? Yeah, I don't know about that one. That that's just that they need to fix that. But um, I don't know. Mac Mac Boy is getting a little little bit little better. Um he definitely needs to move the puck around a little more on the power play because it seems that it's either they pass it down to Pasternak for the one timer, or he's taking the shot from the blue line when he has the when he gets the puck. Um, yeah, Grizzly, all he's really good for is uh, his defensive skills, really, right now, and he, even that's a little shaky. Um, but shame. yeah, I mean, I, I'm liking he's good for his defensive skills, but he plays defense. Isn't that that is that sound right, Boston Bruins fans? Phenomenal, right there. You heard it right from Tom. <laughs> No, but I mean, like, he should. He, I'm saying he doesn't belong on the power play, is what I'm saying. Thank you. He doesn't. Maybe on the Providence Bruins, but this is the big show here. <laughs> um, I mean, yeah. And now with all Mark back, like, that'll get a little boost in women's uh, confidence, too. So, I mean, it's going to it's gonna be tough to beat that goaltending goal tandem, really, when it comes down to the postseason. Um, I will give Swayman um, a little bit of credit in the about past couple games. Definitely has started to get a little bit better. When, when um, Allmark was down a little bit, I was concerned because there was a lot of inconsistency happening. He was seeing some holes in his game, not in the right positions, out of place and everything. I will say in the past week or so, we've seen adjustments made where the confidence looks like it's back and the positioning is improving. I'm not going to say he's out of it right yet because we still need to see a little bit more. But I do think you have a good situation heading into the playoffs. Obviously, if Allmark goes down or some sorts, you, you could be okay with Swayman. You could be, but the question is, is he going to, you know, go down, go down, go, you know, down the downslope with when he, when all marks out, I really, I really think this is like one of the best, you know, chemistry tan goaltending tandems that we've ever, you know, we've ever seen. I, I would agree on that. Yep. They both, they both look like they're there to support one another and they're having fun. And I think it's a, a nice one, two combination. It's almost like a. Um, I think other teams would love the situation the Bruins have right now with their goaltending situation. And no one really expected this to happen when Tuca retired. So I, I mean, mean, look, it, at, it, look it, at us. It, look at me at the beginning of this season when Allmark came in. I was calling for his head. I'll, again, I was calling same. for his head, and Swayman same. ended up getting a little bit more playing time at the beginning. But ever since January first, Allmark must be a Boston Celtic fan or something because something <laughs> happened. You know, when New Year struck or something, maybe, maybe something just clicked. Maybe Phil helped them. I don't know. Dr. Phil over there must have got through them or something and just got all the production in the world to really get this team clicking and everything. So we'll see what the adjustments are made. Again, you got Buffalo would better damn well be a win or you, you, you I'm not going to be a happy camper and you know what happens with that. And, you know, then it gets nasty. And then uh, you got to finish off with Toronto, which is Friday. So we'll see how things go again. It looks like it's Carolina come uh, next week. And I think it would start on May 3rd. Uh, that would be a Tuesday night in Carolina too, unfortunately. So advantage uh, for our home ice would go to Carolina. All right. We got a lot of gripes now to cover. I know Tom's got his Red Sox hat on him. I am absolutely disgusted that you have that hat on right now. Disgusted. Because there's a lot of things I have to say about this team. And the first things I'm going to say starts at the top with your friggin' ownership. Which other sports organization in this lovely land that we live, who has an ownership group that's won four championships since 2004, has a fan base 
that wants to absolutely blast these moronic imbeciles off to another planet because they don't know how to run their freaking sports team. What other team? I, I'll wait. John Henry, Nesson, and all the rest of you jackasses that are part of that group should be absolutely ashamed of yourselves. Because what happened on Wednesday night was one of the most disrespectful things I've ever seen a team do to somebody who had just passed away. It was a major part of your sports organization, and that is Jerry Rem. So Wednesday night, the Red Sox at Fenway Park decided to do a special tribute to Jerry Remy by inviting past people who were broadcasters or sideline reporters or were associated with Jerry in some sort of way. Well, I'm friendly with one person in particular who I absolutely idolized when I was a Red Sox fan uh, growing up, wanted to go to school to be a broadcaster. The best broadcast partners in baseball, which was Don Orsillo and Jerry Remy. We all know the story on Don. Don was ousted after the 2015 season. Imbecile O'Brien was brought in because he backstabbed to get his own way to get the TV job. And Don was uh, pretty much out to get another you know, job. And he's been with the Padres since 2016. Was not a very good split in the least bit. You know, Don was absolutely crushed. That was his... Uh, dream job, grew up Red Sox fan and everything like that. Uh, had to go out and find another job. You know, fans were still crushed. You know, it's been what? Six years since he's left and fans still are ticked. Not just myself, that he's still not sitting in, in that chair. Nesson decided, along with the Red Sox, to intentionally leave Don Orsillo out of the ceremony. And again, invited at first, Don still had his job out with the Padres and everything that he had to take care of. So totally get it that he couldn't be there for that. So then they had a video that was made Monday or Tuesday, you know, before the ceremony, just to have him speak and everything. And they'll put it up on the Jumbotron and everything. About an hour before the game, the ceremony happens. Don gets a message from Nesson management and the Red Sox saying that they are not going to use his video at the park. And uh, that's that. Wasn't going to allow any, any sort of 30 second thing, whatever it was. I don't care how long it was from that sort of thing. Because they felt that only one video in the thing would ruin the flow and it was too much time to take. Those 30 seconds was too much time for him to speak on his behalf about his best friend and everything. That night, Orsillo, I wish I had the picture. I think I do, but I don't know if we can share. Can we share a picture, um, Phil, on the screen? Yeah, just what? send it. Can you just chat? You can send it, Earl, and I can just make you. Do you have it? I can make you a host for a second, or allow you to share. Let me get my, me get my thing up because I want to show people what he what he uh, tweeted out. And I'll never forget it because I didn't sleep one ounce last Wednesday night when this came out at about eleven o'clock at night. I was pissed, along with many other fans of the Red Sox, uh, after they heard about what had happened uh, with uh, the team. All right, I have it right here. All right, my screen is ready. So, um, let me right, go back on. to full screen here. All right, go for it. You should be able to, uh, should allow you. Your screen click? Yep, it should, yeah, share screen, yep. Yep, hitting it. Are you hitting it? It should be allowed, hold on one second. Yeah, it should be allowed. Go for it. All right, there we go. And here it is. All right, can everybody see that right here? Yeah. So Don tweets out a message to everybody because he started to get asked, you know, why was it any apart? You know, we know we we're in San Diego. Did you make a video or some sorts for him? So 
Orsillo goes, I was offered the opportunity to do a video message for my friend and former partner, Jerry Remy, for tonight's ceremony at Fenway Park. Sadly, I was notified by the Red Sox and Nesson that my video would no longer be needed for tonight's ceremony. Here was my message to Jerry. Hey, Boston, Don Orsillo here tonight in San Diego. I would like to thank the Red Sox for the opportunity to talk about my friend. Jerry, I miss you every day. I miss your friendship, your daily text, but mostly your laugh. Without you, Rem, I am not in the major leagues today. We worked together 15 years and the last 13 you battled. I never thought you, you would lose. The strongest person I have ever known. Thank you to the Fenway faithful and Red Sox nation. I promise you Jerry knew how much you loved him and it kept him fighting to the end. I would like to thank Red Sox players for wearing Remy two patch this year. It is so very worthy to Phoebe and the Remy family. I love you all and share in your great pain. All right, let me go back. I think we're there now. I don't know about you guys, but when I get a message that's like that and something intentionally gets left out, all I can think of right there is a complete lack of respect and a lack of any sort of comfort or feeling of the feeling of it's like, like a funeral. If, if, if like your best friend or whatever it was is not allowed to get up there and not allowed to say a couple words on, on somebody on their behalf. That doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't. So that night, fans took to Twitter, took to Facebook, took it, took it by storm to get that message across to the Red Sox to say, we frigging hope that that was a mistake on your part and you better have somebody speak up about what had happened from it. So the next day, that Thursday, they had a day game, I think it was. Those imbeciles over there from Nesson and Sam Kennedy, the biggest snake oiled salesman out there for a baseball organization, went on one of the radio stations and, and said, um, oh yeah, we love Don, but we just didn't feel it was the right thing, yada, yada, yada. My overall take here is the reason that they did not include Don on that is because the fans at Fenway Park would have erupted because of how mismanaged and how disgusting it is that, in my opinion, the best broadcaster in baseball right now, which is Don Orsillo, is not a part of your Red Sox team right now. So I think this was an FU to the fans. This was an FU to Jerry Remy. And... I went on my thing and I, I'm, I boycotted. I'm done. You know, I will not watch another game on Nesson. I am not going to Fenway Park and spending a million dollars to go get a hot dog and watch that garbage baseball team that they decided to put out there as a product this, uh, this, uh, this season. Disgusting. Disgusted beyond words with what was done right here. All they needed to do was put the video up on the screen and it would have made the fans happy. It would have been a great sign of respect and it would have allowed Remy to get the tribute that he was rightfully deserved. This was not about the Red Sox. This was about Jerry Remy and they royally screwed it up. It's just, it's, it's amazing to me that a billion dollar sports organization continues making these insanely moronic mistakes on their PR team just to stick it to individuals. They stuck it to John Lester when he left. They stuck it to Terry Francona when he left. They even stuck it to Nomar when he was traded way back in 2004. This team can't make the right decisions, no matter what it is. Look at Mookie Betts, same deal. They stick it to these players and they stick it to people for absolutely no right at all. And it starts at the top with John Henry and his moronic little puppets of an organization for his management team. Rant over. Anybody else have anything to say on that front? Well, I wonder, how did Dave O'Brien uh, backstab his way into that position? He was on the radio for EEI. Uh, I he know, went yeah. Behind, yep, he went, behind, uh, the, he went behind the back. He went over to, uh, it was Sean McGrail from Nesson and Narachi, who's the producer, and 
He's buddy buddy with Tom Werner, and they made some sort of weaselly behind behind the scenes deal because Orsillo's contract and everything was coming up, and blindsided him, blindsided him on air. Um, it ended up being a report in the Globe that Orsillo wasn't coming back. Don had no idea about this. You know, he's 15 years with the team and everything. You you would think that there was some sort of a uh, th- this is what's upcoming. So that that's the whole situation back from 2015 was uh, him being being fired, being yeah. fired. You know, because O'Brien was 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 involved with that, and it was well, very I mean, interesting. Probably because they just they wanted someone cheaper. I mean, I think in whether Dave was complicit. It, with I, that see, I don't know what I mean, the what the dynamics that's were. Probably what it was. It has and to be, I, and I wouldn't be surprised, Phil, if that's a lot of it. What what that was about. Um, you know, money usually is, is the thing from it. And we all know how cheap sometimes the Red Sox can be just how it is with their contract negotiations. But the main reason this was back with Larry Lucchino and he was a part of the team and Werner came out and said that they, they want more of a professional broadcaster, Dave O'Brien, because Don Orsillo laughs too much and has too much of a giddy time on air with Jerry Remy. That's what they said. And then fans I mean, just absolutely took, a, took took that and said, screw, screw this team. I mean, so, I would disagard all that sort of thing, especially when someone's trying to make it, when they come on with official statement, they just kind of mask, you know, we're doing this because of the numbers, but which is whatever uh, to throw Dave O'Brien. I mean, I don't know the, <coughs> the true ins and outs to really nail Dave O'Brien for that. But if someone were to come to you and say, here is, you know, you can be the on-air talent or broadcaster for the Red Sox, you'd probably take it because who wouldn't? And I'm sure, you know, who knows, like, if he was that, you know, more of a snake about it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, what I heard about, I didn't know anything about this, actually, until I think I saw your post and I was reading some other stuff online. <coughs> and there's a lot of weird stuff on both sides of this thing. Well, I guess Don Absolo had hired a comp- or a production company to help him make something. Didn't end up making something. And then, like, was just kind of like, oh, I'll make something later. And then, like, just the Red Sox organization didn't help out a lick. And the fact that, you know, yeah, I mean, the very fact that we're, it just, it didn't happen, Dorman still wasn't part of it. It's kind of, it's weak and weird. And just like the whole thing is, you know, what are you doing, Red Sox? I mean, you're already at a point, you're already at in a position where the fans are kind of like getting, like people are losing, it's losing its traction in the town, the sport, the game, like the Red Sox as a team, baseball as a sport, nationally uh and locally they're uh, are losing footing like it's all like you're and i know hein bloom is just doing his thing he's a he's a tampa bay guy and he's going to downscale he's downsize the team and make it almost like small ball in a lot of ways but it's tampa, the tampa bay red sox yeah i mean but it's just like if winning cures all ails or all yeah yeah winning cures all ailments and if they start winning, I think it'd be less of a uh, of a slap in the face. But you know what? It's, it's still a slap in the face. I shouldn't uh, diminish the fact that they wouldn't have Don Arcillo. So 15 years. I don't saw, you know, come I, on, man. I, I still look at the guy's at life we're talking and about. I say to myself, <coughs> 2015, this all happened. It's 2022 now. And fans, I'm not the only, I'm, I'm, I don't like to over-exaggerate. I don't like, I am not alone. If you went on Twitter or asked fans opinions on the whole matter, you always get back the stupidest move this ownership has ever made. And this even goes with Lester and Nomar and Mookie and everything like that. It's Don or Silo being ousted as broadcaster is the number one thing people are still talking about to this day. You know, people miss Mookie and everything, but they understand the money side of this things. You had a beloved icon here in Boston who teamed up with Rem to be the best broadcasting pair in baseball. And now he's still not here. It's seven years. And people say, some people say, you know, it's crazy because some people can't move on. I'm not going to move on. I'm not. I'm going to continue to make my word heard and the stance clear and Nesson and they can all take take it uh take it to the grave i mean it was the single most disgusting thing this group has done because they don't listen to the fans that's the biggest thing there's no 
there's no right or wrong with it. They don't listen to what the fans who pay to go to the park and support this team, they don't listen to the fan base. They, they, they just don't take anybody's opinion to believe. It's, it's, it's absolutely remarkable. And that is a big, big, big way to lose your fan base. Now, and now the Patriots who do the exact same thing. We haven't thing. really talked about this season yet. I want to just mention oh, it. All right, quick, fair enough. But it's a seven and eleven <laughs> group right now. Okay. Again, we we've mentioned Bloom before on this broadcast uh, on our show. We've talked about how the Tampa Bay Red Sox basically that's their take on everything, and this team is so flawed and so 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 many missing pieces. And it's comical that this is the group they went into the season with when you have no closers, you have a bullpen that I think the Worcester Sox, the Woo Sox are better. They don't have a right fielder. They're expecting Bradley to be their everyday right fielder. You way, way, way overrated Kiki Hernandez folks in center field, you know, and a lot of it was because he got as hot as a pistol in the playoffs last year, but he's hitting a buck 50. You have an issue with Bogarts and Devers with what they're going to do long-term with them. You have a first baseman who can't hit the broad side of a barn. You have a catching group who can't, number one, call a game. They can't hit. They can't throw. But yet you play them every day. And you have pretty much right now two pitchers that you can probably count on to get the job done, and that's Whitlock and Evaldi. I, 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 it's just, it's, 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 it's awful. It's just awful. You're going to be fourth place. You're going to be fourth place. Have any of you watched any of the games? I've Tom, watched a little seen bit. Anything from it? Let's hear Tom's side of anything. Tom has, no, Tom, I don't know what baseball is this season. Good. I'm the same way right now. No, I mean, I, I haven't, I mean, I don't, I don't get Ness and I don't care to sit there for four hours watching a baseball game. Um, I will be going to the Mother's Day game, though. So we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, I, I, I don't, I watched the Padres and Dodgers game. Uh, I think it was over the weekend where like the Padres ended up beating the Dodgers for the first time and, however many games. And that was more exciting than a Red Sox game, really. Baseball is a hurting product right now. It's hurting. And it's sad. That was my passion. That's what I loved and everything like that. But right now, I don't even think, again, I'm not watching and supporting from everything, but if I was, I wouldn't waste my time. I wouldn't waste my time. There's too many other things in life that if somebody doesn't give their all effort and, and everything like that, I have other things to do. So it's unfortunate that that's the situation that they're in right now. Yes, it's early. I get it. But there's too many red flags right now for me to, to, to even have any sort of confidence with what this team's going to look like from, from here on out. Let's turn the gears now over to the Patriots because the draft is upcoming. Um, they got a lot of work to do, I think, you know, to, to see how they're going to get to, you know, back to the playoffs, truthfully, and see how things are going to look, uh, you know, trying to get a championship again. My question here is, do you think this team is going to be competitive this, up se- uh, this upcoming season? Uh, I, I don't know. I mean, the rest of the division is, is looking honestly tougher than it has in a while. It's been a long time since this division has been competitive, really. I mean, the Dolphins are going to be making a push now. The Bills have been making that push for the last five years. Um, so, I mean, even the Jets are trying to make moves to make a push now. I mean, it, it's not looking good. And Bill's 70 years old now. Yeah. Uh, and he doesn't have know. a staff, basically. Now we got a staff. Matt Patricia's your offensive coordinator. How do you feel about that? 
Let that sink in, Patriot fans. You also don't really have a line. And I think that's the biggest thing they have to emphasize here at the draft because you got rid of, uh, what was it, Shaq Mason? Mm -hmm. Consistent producer who's always been a part of that, you know, line and everything. You don't have him. You do have uh, Devante uh, Parker, right? That's the new guy that they got from, uh, from Mac Jones. I think that that's a good move right there. I, I need to see a little bit more of Mac. You know, I'm interested to see what he does with a full season under his belt with a training camp where he's the starter and everything like that. I think the future looks bright, but again, you're, you're trying to compare him to Tom Brady and everything like that. And I don't, he's not going to be Tom Brady. He's not. So I'm curious to see what he looks like with a little bit more weapons and um, hopefully they get some, get something done with the draft. Anybody else have anything to add on any, any front? Yeah, I think the, the paths are slipping. I mean, they have been the last two seasons and, you know, this might be the end. This might be the nail in the coffin for Bill Belichick. If he doesn't um, really turn them into some sort of contender. I mean, I don't really, uh, you know, Brady gets the upper hand if you think about it. Of course. Because Bill has not won without Tom. And I'm guaranteeing you that irks (laughs) Bill Belichick like you can't even believe it. Sure, he doesn't show it. Yep. Through his actions. Well, maybe last offseason. Well, we'll have to see how things look from everything. Again, we want to wish the Celtics all the best in round two. We want to wish the Bruins good health and hopefully a long, solid run in their playoffs. And we want them to the Stanley Cup. It's been, now it's 11 years since they won their last one. So we want to see how that goes. And so we'll see how the Patriots do. And if you notice, I didn't mention another team because they don't deserve it. We will see you next time on another episode of Face the Facts. We appreciate you watching and listening and ranting and all that lovely jazz that we always do. We'll see you next time.